tell Pastor Kirk's not here today. He's uh, on vacation doing what he loves, fishing with his son, and I think one of his brothers. So we're going to have a guest speaker today, and Bobby Keys been here before, so we'll listen to him preach and listen to the good word. So I'll just say a quick prayer, and we'll get started today. Uh, if you bow your heads. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this beautiful weather we're having. we grateful that Pastor Kurt was able to take some time off and to do what he enjoys. And we just pray that today you open our hearts and our minds to listen to your words today and that we can go forward and take those words and just put it into our daily walk with you, Father God. We thank you for, that, for all that you've done for us. And I'm just thank you for, for everyone that's here and for everyone that's watching on, uh, on the live stream, Father. So we just praise you and give you all the glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone, yes. 
praise God today as we lift our voices up to the Lord. Psalm 95, 1. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation.
people in worship, Lord. Let us fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and bless Bobby today as he brings this message, Lord. Open our ears and open our hearts, God, for what you have to say through Bobby this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hey, can we thank the praise and worship team for that wonderful time? Thank you. And thank you, Scott, for starting off our service and the greeting and the prayer. Well, how are we doing this morning? All right. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce myself for uh, those of us who haven't met yet. And it's been a little while since I've been here. So uh, my name is Bobby Key. I'm here with my wife, Rebecca, who's over here. And we have our two little girls, Bella and Sayla, who are now over in the, the kids' class. And um, I am a Foursquare ordained pastor, a graduate of Life Pacific University. Uh, yes, shout out. In the past, uh, Becky and I, or Rebecca and I, we planted a church down in Long Beach, and then we were pastoring up in the Sacramento area for almost 10 years after that. And the uh, Lord has relocated us, relocated us down here to the South Bay, and so uh, we moved down here about a year ago. And praise be to God, when I was here last time and I was preaching, you might not have known this. But I was praying hard that God would open up a door for me to have a, a bit of a career change as we're getting ready to plant a church uh, on God's timetable. He hasn't told us exactly when to start, but soon, so maybe next year. Um, in the meantime, well, how does God want to provide work for us and career and all those types of things? And so the job that I wanted was with L.A. City. The only problem was that there was a uh, complete hiring freeze for the whole city for over a year. And the position I wanted, there was uh, no openings. But the city uh, hired me in August. And so now I work for the Department of Building and Safety. Uh, but in my heart of hearts, I'll always be a pastor. In fact, I got into the office about a couple months ago, uh, nice and early before the workday, and had my Bible open. And I was reading there. And one of my coworkers came up to me and says, what are you doing? I said, just reading the Bible. He's like, yeah, the plumbing code book. Because, you know, we're, I'm a building inspector now. And I said, no, the Bible. He said, what? You know, no, you're reading the Bible here? I thought you were talking about a code book. No, the original code book right there, man. Everything you need to know about life. Someone said Bible surely stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. And uh, so anyway, I was, I was reading that and... Anyway, God's been really good to us, and huge honor to be with you this morning, to praise the King of Kings with you, um, to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit at work in this place, and an honor to fill in in the pulpit where Pastor Kurt brings the word, a great man of God, a great teacher of the word, and God bless him on his uh, fishing trip. May he catch one this big, right? <laughs> And uh, may he be refreshed. And friends, it's just really good to be here with you this morning. In a little while, I'm going to ask you to look at a passage of scripture in John chapter 6 and verse 16. And it's a passage that many of you guys are familiar with. You'll recognize it when we start to read it. We'll be there in a little while. But as an overview, I'll mention it like this. It's a story about the disciples being caught up in a storm that they did not expect and one that was terrifying. And at least on a surface level, you and I can begin to identify with those disciples this morning if you have ever been caught up in an unexpected storm. Now, not that likely if you've lived in Redondo Beach your whole life. Unexpected weather for us is, I don't know, a 60 degree day instead of 65 or something, you know. But for those of you who traveled beyond or lived in other places, can I see some hands? How many of you have ever been, experienced some interesting weather before? All right, so everybody out there before. Anybody was, ever been shocked by hail, just hail falling down that you didn't see coming, a couple of you? Anybody ever been snowed in someplace before? Okay, a couple of you have? You have? Um, rain unexpected or, or fog so, so thick driving that maybe you have to pull over on the side of the road because you can't see that far ahead of you. You guys know what we're talking about with these kinds of storms. Let me tell you a story from my childhood. Um, when I was growing up, 
my parents, they owned a small store in the, the community that we lived in. This was Acton, California, uh, still LA County, but up in the mountains where everyone has horses and ranches and things. That's where I grew up. Yes, it's a great place for riding dirt bikes. That's exactly right. And not a great place to be obsessed with skateboarding as I was because no one has concrete, but it's okay. Now I'm in South Bay, so I'm in skateboarding heaven. It's great. Um, so my parents, they own this little store and money was always tight. And, uh, on one day my mother was determined to get to the bank to make a deposit because some of the vendors that we had paid their checks wouldn't clear if we didn't make this deposit. It had to get into the bank. And I have a very determined mother and I don't know if God made mothers any other way. And so she was going to get to this bank. The problem was, is Acton is in a bit of a valley. There's, there's mountains uh, all around. And when it rains, it floods. There's, fat, there's flash floods in the little community. So we go to turn on the only road to get to the bank of this little town. And the road is blocked off. Somebody who was looking out for our safety and everyone else's put a barricade in the road. And if you look down the road, the power lines were leaning over because the ground was so saturated that they were no longer able to hold the power lines even up straight. And there, the, the area of Acton Town, if you could even call it that, like one bank and two restaurants and a barbershop, um, was uh, maybe a few feet deep in water. So my mother takes a look at that and she says, Bobby, get out of the car and move that barricade. So. I got out of the car. Yes, mom, we moved the barricade and we're driving down this road until the water was high enough. I'm not even exaggerating. The minivan started floating down the road. <laughs> we made it to the bank. In fact, we almost crashed into that bank, um, but there was a planter on the sides and the tires of the van caught a little bit of traction and she was able to kind of float, move the van around. We pulled over and she was able to make her deposit that day. <laughs> Had we crashed in that bank, we probably would have made a deposit and that might have been I mean, a withdrawal. That might have been nice. But anyway, so crazy weather and we've all experienced some different types of weather. And let's go ahead and look at the weather that the disciples experienced. John chapter six and verse 16 the heading for this passage of scripture says, Jesus walks on water. It says on verse 16, that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon, a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. Let's go ahead and pause just for a bit. So has, have anybody, has anybody in here ever been to the Sea of Galilee before, ever been to Israel and seen this? Uh, I've, I've been there before. It's a little bit like the town that I grew up in, although this is a bigger area, but there's mountains all the way around it. And when the wind uh, sweeps in over these mountains, it turns up the water in a fierce way and things can go from, from placid to fierce real quick. The Baker exegetical commentary on this passage says, the Sea of Galilee lies about 600 feet below sea level. Cool air from the southeastern tablelands can rush in to displace the warm, moist air over the lake, turning up the water in a violent squall. Even today, power boats in this area must remain docked as the winds buffet the water. How much more could violent storms have wreaked havoc on the wooden boats in Jesus' time? So the disciples, after rowing for three and a half miles, uh, the disciples were driven off course and found themselves halfway to Magnola, where the lake was the widest. So the storm was getting fierce. The waves were picking up. Um, and I don't know if you caught this part in the passage, but it says darkness had fallen on them. So it's dark outside, and they're in the widest part of the lake. Swimming to the shore probably is no longer an option, and certainly they were fearful. It was a storm that they were caught in, that they were powerless to escape, and one that they did not see coming. 
So picking up again in verse 19, it says that they had rode for three, three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. And they were terrified. But he called out to them and he said, do not be afraid. I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat and get this. And immediately they arrived at their destination. So what we're looking at when we read John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21, is we're looking at a story that was witnessed by eyewitnesses and recorded and passed down generation to generation for us to be able to observe and see that, that Jesus is a miracle worker. Let's go ahead and think about that for a minute. We wanna, I want to bring out a couple points of explanation on this passage. The first is, this is a story about a miracle. Now, it's not the only miracle that's recorded that Jesus performed. In fact, there are 37 miracles that Jesus performed, if you read through the gospel and write them down. But there's even more miracles that Jesus did than the 37. Listen to this interesting passage. If you haven't heard this before, this is a bit of a mind blower. John chapter 21, verse 25 says, Jesus also did many other things. So many other things, more than are recorded in the gospels. It says in John chapter 21, verse 25, it says, if they were all written down, all the marvelous, praiseworthy, miraculous things that Jesus did, if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world could not contain the books that would be written. Isn't that amazing? So it makes you think, well, what else did he do? Who else did he heal? What other snacks did he multiply to feed thousands? Who else did he raise from the grave? I mean, what else? And those are things that we're going to be able to uh, learn about when we get to heaven. You know, and Jesus can be able to explain those to us, or eyewitnesses can tell us about how he changed their life. But the other question that it rings up is, well, why do we have the story read about today? Why do we have the 37 stories of miracles that the Bible tells us? What is it about these stories that were so important that people wrote them down and the disciples, followers of Jesus from generation to generation, they've recorded, they've passed on. Why did God want these in his book for us? The answer is found in John chapter 20 and verse 30 where it says also the disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs. Oh, you know what? I think I have to look it up. I think I wrote down the wrong reference. John chapter 20, verse 30 says, oh, verse 31 in John chapter 20, these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. There's something about these stories that is sacred and God has intended to build your faith and that you might realize that Jesus is more than a rabbi. He's more than a good teacher. He's more than a good man. He is the very son of God, the one who we are to look to and count on for our salvation. He's the savior of the world. Am I right? Yes. The miracles of Jesus demonstrate Jesus' absolute authority and power over the devil and sickness and death and nature, and thereby confirming to all that he is indeed the Messiah and the Son of God. And also, these signs and wonders of Jesus, they testify to his limitless compassion for people and his longing to see people set free from all bondage. They let us know that not only does God have the power, God loves people enough to intervene in their life so that they can experience freedom and life. Right. Amen? Amen? So that's the first insight. This passage is about a miracle, and now we have a better understanding about why we have these miracle stories in the scripture. They're to build our faith, to help us to know who Jesus is, what his authority is like, so that we might truly uh, worship him and grow to understand him deeply. Now, the second insight that I want to point up or point out is that the disciples experienced storms too. 
the disciples experienced storms too. Here's what I mean. Their status as being disciples, those who were handpicked that would later go on to become the apostles and the leaders of this Christian movement. Just because they were disciples, it didn't make them immune to being in uncomfortable situations or scary situations or being in unexpected storms. Perhaps they thought, now we don't know, but perhaps they thought that because they were doing the right things by following Jesus, maybe they thought they would never end up in a situation like this. And that is a common misunderstanding that people think. People think oftentimes that storms are for people who don't go to church, for people that don't pray, for people that don't have faith, for people that don't tithe, or for people that don't do good things. But I do those things, and so I can experience my life without storms. And eh, try again. It turns out that even disciples occasionally find themselves in storms. But here's the good news, friends. The good news is, is they weren't in the storm alone. The key to getting out of the storm, by the way, was letting Jesus in the boat and recognizing Jesus in the midst of the storm. And this exposes a difference in God's wants and our wants a lot of the time. When we find ourselves in a stormy situation, I'm speaking metaphorically about life, I'm talking about career changes. I'm talking about gas prices going up. I'm talking about wars and rumors of wars happening in the world. I'm talking about a pandemic that we thought might last a few weeks that's gone on for a couple years. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about relationships. I'm talking about challenges that we have, those types of storms too. Oftentimes we want Jesus to spare us from being in the storm or we wanted to show up and calm the storm right away to get us out of it quickly, what God wants is for us to find Jesus in the midst of the storm. Now, God's not just messing with us. He's not just looking at us because it amuses him and he's God and this is his entertainment. He's not trying to break you. He doesn't want the storm to break us, but rather to bend us toward Jesus. And when we allow the storms of life to have us bend towards Jesus, they are a blessing. The disciples did a few things very right in this story. In the midst of the storm, they saw Jesus, and they heard Jesus speak, and they welcomed him into the boat. That forms the outline for what I believe God wants to encourage all of us with today. They saw Jesus, they heard Jesus speak, and they welcomed him into their boat. This idea of seeing Jesus, I'm going to say an application for us, if you're taking notes, if you want to try to remember this, is that we need to seek Jesus all the time, but certainly in the midst of life's storms. We need to seek Jesus. Quick story. A number of years ago, before Becky and I had kids, and we were married, we were living up in Sacramento, and one Sunday afternoon, uh, Becky went down, went to go take a nap, and we lived in a small little apartment. The whole thing couldn't have been more than 800 square feet, and probably smaller than that. And um, so she goes into the, the, the bedroom to take a nap. I'm out in the living room watching TV or reading a book. I don't remember. It's been a little while since then. And uh, she sleeps about 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden I hear my phone ring. And I look at my phone, and Becky is calling me on the phone from the other room. And I'm thinking, that's the strangest thing. She, the, the place is so small, she probably could have whispered, and I could have heard her from where I was. But she didn't know that. She thought, hey, you know, Bobby probably is out running errands or riding a skateboard or doing something. But I was right there. And that's like God on our journey a lot. We don't realize just how close he is to us. God is so close to us that he can hear us when we pray. Not because he has super amazing hearing from heaven, although God is perfect in every way, but because he's close enough to hear. 
I was thinking about that in regards to the passage of Scripture that says that, that God is in, speaks in a whisper, or God is in a whisper. And I was thinking about why a whisper? And I was thinking it's probably because he's that close. He doesn't need to speak loudly because he's with us wherever we are. On this subject, the Lord told Jeremiah, the prophet, I've always been present with you. Friends, throughout your entire life, of every moment of, of your life, even if spiritually you felt a thousand miles away from God or felt like he had left your life, he's never been far from you. Just as he told Jeremiah, it's same for you and I. He's always been present with you. How or why is it, though, that oftentimes we can feel like it's been a long time since I've experienced his presence? I feel like he's not with me anymore. Maybe he's not covering me anymore. Maybe he's not blessing me anymore. Why is it sometimes that we feel this way? There's probably a lot of answers to this question, but I believe one of them has to do with what it is we're filling our heart with. I heard one pastor one time say that uh, people today are kind of like those old school fishermen that would have their net, and every day they'd go out on the boat and they'd throw their, their net over and see what they catch. But our net is looking for worries. Every morning, people, they wake up, and they're looking for something to worry about. So they take their net, and they throw it out, and they pull it up, and they see if there's anything in there. Is there anything in my health that I can worry about? Is there anything in my marriage that I can worry about? Is there anything with my kids that I can worry about? Is there anything in my finances that I can worry about? And if we pull it up, and we haven't found anything to worry about, you know what we do? We don't just go, well, great. Life is great. I have peace today. This is good. You know what we do? We go into the boat. We find a bigger net. We throw a bigger net out there. And that would like, be the equivalent of saying, okay, now I'm going to read the newspaper or read the news on my phone. I want to see if there's anything in my country I can worry about, anything in Congress I can worry about. I haven't found anything there. Is there anything in the world that I can worry about? We're just constantly looking for things to worry about. And because of that, oftentimes our hearts are filled with worries and concerns of this world versus with the peace that surpasses understanding because our hearts are filled with God and his word. When we think about that, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, a very common uh, passage that many of us know and love, makes even more sense where the Holy Spirit moves upon the Apostle Paul to tell all followers of Jesus, don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then it says in verse 7, you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Have you come to realize that our hearts, in the sense of the center of our life, our belief system, our feelings, our motivations, uh, our heart is like our homes, and there's only so much room. And at some point, you got to get really specific about what you want to have in your heart or what you want to have in your home, because otherwise, it's just going to be a mess. And there's only so many things you can pile up in that garage before you can't even park the car in there anymore. You know what I'm talking about? No? Okay, maybe it's just myself here, but... <laughs> Hearts are like homes, there's only so much room, and they will either be filled with worry and fear, or they're going to be filled with peace and joy, depending on what you're putting in your heart. Mark Batterson wrote a book a while back called Circle Maker, and in it, he said, who you become is determined by how you pray. Ultimately, the transcript of your prayers becomes the script of your life. This morning, I think Jesus wants us to think about the story of this miracle and the disciples in the storm and him calling to them and telling them, don't be afraid, and them realizing that the answer to their troubles was to seek Jesus and tell us this morning, you got to seek Jesus. We need to be seeking him in our prayer time because that's where we're going to find peace and joy. The second thing that disciples really had right is they heard Jesus calling. They heard Jesus calling. Friends, have you found that God speaks when we slow down? Or maybe a better way of saying that is that God is often speaking to us, but we listen best when we've slowed, slowed down ourselves, our life. Have you found that to be true? 
It's an important part of our culture to be busy. One time I was uh, at Disneyland and I was on that ride. It's a small world. And we were going through and there's all these caricatures of cultures from around the world, you know, all over. And it's like, oh, you know, little Dutch children and little Mexican children. And there's like how they dress and everything. And, and I was thinking if there was somebody from Los Angeles, a doll from Los Angeles in there, it would be going twice as fast as all the other dolls. Like smoke and sparks would be coming out of it. It would just be going crazy. That's our culture. Many people around us find it, feel guilty if they aren't constantly moving, constantly doing something. Our heroes are these business startup companies, guys who sleep on the couch of their office, people that work for 20 hours a day or 18 hours a day in these unsustainable lives. That's who we look up to. It's our culture. And this busyness has resulted in a generation of people, even Christians, being closed off. Maybe it's unintentionally, but people are spending less and less time seeking the Lord, waiting on the Lord, hearing from the Lord. It's interesting that there's that passage of scripture that says, be still and know that I am God. It doesn't just say, know that I am God. You would think that that would be a plenty great scripture right there. But the Lord says, no, no, be still and know that I am God. Like there's a dimension of not even understanding his beauty and his power and his worthiness to be praised if you just can't be still and marvel a little bit here and there. To be still means remaining in a place of rest. It means motionless. It means stationary. Another definition for be still means free from sound or noise. And yet another means free from turbulence or commotion. Be still and know that he is God. Here's my paraphrase of that passage. We'll likely be numb to the presence of God and be blind to his awesome involvement in our lives. So long as we keep living over caffeinated lives while overworking and underresting and living in the sensory overload of binge watching Netflix while toying with our smartphones and running nonstop from one weekend activity to another. How are we doing okay? Are we doing all right this morning? A little heavy? Next time I preach, I'll bring more jokes, okay? I promise. All right. A number of years ago, I was directing a summer camp for teenagers, Christian summer camp for teenagers. And we had great speakers and we had a a wonderful worship band. And it was just a really great experience for teenagers to see that being Christian can be fun, but also having time to learn about God and have a fellowship of other teenagers that were focused on that too. There's about 350 youth that were up at the Foursquare camp. If you guys have been up there, it's Camp Cedar Crest. But me and the other leaders of the camp, we thought we're going to set teenagers up to live a life for Christ better if we also don't make them think that a great Christian experience is the best band and the best speakers and you got to be way up in the mountains. They got to know that they can hear from God when it's just them because you have more of those moments in your life than, than these. This only comes once a week or twice a week if you have a prayer meeting or something, but God wants to speak to you every day. So after one session, we made a point to not schedule anything, no activities, just we did a lot of other stuff, but we weren't playing capture the flag afterward or anything else. We we said we gave all the kids a journal and we told them to grab their Bible and to find some place in this beautiful area of nature where they're by themselves and not distracted and open up their Bible and think about something that they had heard and just allow God to speak to them. And if he does, to write it down. So many teenagers came up to me after this experience. They were out there for maybe a half hour and said, this is the first time I've ever heard God speak to me. But you know what I thought? It's true, it's the first time that they've ever heard God speak to them, probably, but it's certainly not the first time that God's ever spoke to them but perhaps it was the first time that they were still and they listened. God wants to speak to us all the time. The thing that changed in this story 
is they saw Jesus in the storm and they heard Jesus speak. And when they heard Jesus speak, they released their fears. They trusted him. They did this third thing. They welcomed Jesus into the boat. When the disciples welcomed Jesus into the boat, they were welcoming their friend. Jesus is a friend of sinners, is he not? Jesus is the best friend. He's amazing. But Jesus is unlike any other friend you will ever have in this life. He also just happens to be God. And God just happens to be a fancy theological word, omnipotent. And I didn't even say it right. Omnipotent, which means all the power. He has all the power. It's an amazing thing to have a friend like that, isn't it? When, we, when they welcome Jesus into the boat, and for us, thinking about how we might do that, I guess you could say the boat could be a bit of like an analogy of your life, welcoming Jesus into your life in the midst of a storm. And to welcome Jesus correctly into our life, it has to do with yielding our will and surrendering our agenda. And there might actually be nothing wrong with our agenda or sinful about our agenda, but it comes to a place of recognizing his authority, his kingship, his lordship over us. That's welcoming in him into your boat. And until you do that, friends, you'll never be able to really experience what David wrote about when he penned Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want and don't you want that? Don't you want to know what that's like to have the Lord as your shepherd, to be in a place where there are no wants because you are satisfied in the deepest and most profound way spiritually because of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. I know there's somebody in here this morning. You came because you're looking for some soul restoration. The Lord is speaking to you today. He's the answer. He's the solution. Will you welcome him into your boat? He restores my soul. He leads me into paths of righteousness for his namesake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. When Jesus was welcomed into the boat, get this, you got to get this part of the story. This is so amazing. They're in the, the widest part of the Sea of Galilee and the storm is raging and Jesus comes out walking on the water. And when Jesus gets in the boat, they are instantly on the shore. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. That's what the scripture says. I can't even explain it. I, I, don't, I don't get it. We need some triple PhD physicist to explain to us how this is even possible, but Jesus can do it. It just, you get Jesus in the boat and you get to where you need to be. Too often we're focused about where we need to be instead of focusing on, I want Jesus in my boat. Are you there? When Jesus was welcomed the boat, they were transported from the storm to the other side. Uh, a few weeks ago, well, I should say this, since the beginning of this year, and I'm not really complaining, we have a very good life, but since the beginning of this year, we've been in a very subtle storm, my family. Um, some of you, you can laugh inside, it's, it's, they're not big problems, but it's just like, you, for those of you who have young kids, you know this like, there has been sickness in my home nonstop since January. It's like, first, this kid's got a runny nose. Now it's a cough. Now she's better. Now this kid's got a runny nose, and it's got a cough, and now it's better. Oh, yeah, and then that one, she's got COVID now. Okay, that's fine. Two days later, she's okay. Now you've got COVID now. Okay, now mommy's sick. Now I'm sick. And it's just like boom, 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 like one thing after another. Okay, God, what are you doing? Now, I'm a pastor, but um, my wife is a woman of great faith, and we have, this, uh, we have this arrangement. When she comes up with a really good idea, I say, is it okay if I say that was my idea? Because she just has great ideas. And, <laughs> and um, when we were in the middle of this, she says, hey, Bobby, why don't you get the anointing oil yeah. and pray for the, pray for the girls? 
like, that's a great idea. Can I say that was my idea? <laughs> so we went over and we grabbed this little vial of oil we keep in the house. I don't remember when the last time we used it, but it seems like we end up using it about once a year. We go into the girls. I, I don't know when the last time they were ever anointed and prayed over with oil. Maybe when they were, you know, the baby dedication, you know, at church when they were babies. I don't know. I don't remember. Probably earlier than that, but I just don't remember. So I, I needed to explain to them what it is. They're kind of old enough now that's like, you can put some oil on my head? What are you talking about? And um, so I was explaining. I said, you know, in the scriptures, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And God is with us, and he is our healer. And just as this is real, and just as you can smell the aroma, the presence of God by his spirit is with us in this room. Not only that, but us doing this is an expression of our faith in the Bible, because the Bible says, anyway, sick, let him be anointed with oil, let him be prayed for. And so we're going to do what the Bible says. We trust in the Lord. And then so that they wouldn't be too worded out, worded out too, I thought, you know, I'm going to anoint myself. So I put some oil right on my own head. They prayed for me. I asked my, my, I had one daughter, she wasn't even sick. And I was like, you want to get anointed too? She said, I'm good. I'm like, no problem. So I prayed for my, uh, my, my daughter who was sick, anointed her. Oh my goodness, she, she was being so ministered to, so blessed afterward. I think Becky was like, my turn. So I prayed for Becky, anointed with oil, prayed for her. And then after that, my, my uh, seven-year-old, who again, was feeling great. She's like, okay, I want to be anointed too. So we prayed for her and it was just, in the middle of a small storm. This is family stuff, right? Just regular life. The presence of Jesus. Jesus in our storm. Friends, this morning, you got you to gotta know this by now. I'm not talking about the weather. I'm talking about life. I'm talking about God. I'm talking about your soul. I'm talking about the plans he has for you being good and about you, how he wants you to experience his peace in a profound way. And maybe for some of you this morning to experience a breakthrough when it comes to trusting Jesus and knowing his peace. And I know also, this is a great crowd, by the way. Thank you guys for coming out this morning. Um, it's awesome to have you all here. It's just fun worshiping Jesus with a group. So this is awesome. But um, I know in a room this size, someone in here is going through a storm. Maybe someone in here is married and they're, they're not getting along with their spouse and maybe it's been that way for a long time. Maybe there's someone in here who's not feeling well, got some bad news from a doctor. Maybe someone who's carrying that burden for a family member who's sick and you just feel the weight of it. Maybe the financial pressures are getting to you or other stresses in your life and you can feel like those disciples that are out in that storm because of that. What I want to say is, I don't know how he'll do it. And I don't know when he will do it. But I know that my Jesus is faithful. Amen. And I know that if you put your hope and your faith, your trust in him, you do not have to give in to a spirit of fear, but you can lean into God and you can stand your ground with the strength that he provides because God is with you. And the scriptures promise that there is no weapon that is formed against you that can prosper when God is your strength. And I am confident that you will experience the deliverance and the power of God. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for an opportunity to praise you this morning. Thank you for just the blessing of being with this, this tribe of faith, with this church family, Lord. Thank you for all those who are streamed in online, people from this state, from out of state, from other countries, who are growing in the Lord, who are being encouraged this day. And I pray, Lord, that everybody, all my friends who are hearing this, Lord, that you would work in their life and that we would all develop the discipline of seeking you always and especially in the midst of the storm. May we learn how to do life in such a way that there's times for stillness and waiting and quiet that we might get really good at hearing your voice and hearing you speak. And may we all, not reluctantly, but gladly, as it says in the scriptures, eagerly, how they let you in the boat, we want to be eager to surrender and welcome your will and your way in our life. If there's anybody here this morning 
who doesn't know you, Jesus, or, or maybe they don't know if they've ever given their life to you. Maybe they don't know that if they were to, to die today, if they'd be welcomed into heaven. Lord, I pray that right now, if they desire it, that they would call out to you in their heart and they would say, Jesus, save me. Forgive me of my sins. And I pray that right now they would be born again, that they would be transformed by the indwelling of your spirit. Lord, that you would wipe all the sins away, erase the, the past, give them a brand new slate, and that you would teach them how to walk with you and understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.
Let's lay it all down in our midst, in our troubles, Lord, in the storms. Let's let you in the boat, Lord, and let's not get the worries in our brain every morning. Let us not think about stuff to worry about. Let's just lay it all down, Lord, at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen.